I didn't asked to be called the world's greatest living explorer, but in 1984, we had the greatest number of exploratory records at that time. I would very much like to have done what my dad had done, which was to command the Royal Scots Greys Tank Regiment, but I failed the A-levels twice, and therefore couldn't become the commanding officer. So I stayed in the British Army as long as I could, maybe eight years. And after that, you were chucked out and got married. She didn't have any money either. So um, we tried to think, what had I done in the army which could make a living? Ginny, my late wife, found that the Norwegians had never managed to do a bipolar expedition, meaning to go the whole way around Earth vertically on its surface without flying. So she decided we would break polar records. And uh, the reason we went for something which had never been done before was because we couldn't get sponsorship unless it was something that had never been done before. And for seven years, we worked every day unpaid, working in pubs at weekends to make a living. And we got 1,900 sponsors after seven years. We had been told by the Foreign Office we would never be allowed to go unless we got some actual practice in the Arctic proper. People were sort of taking bets that we would come to grief in a crevasse before we even got away from the pole. All this was sort of negative. So you have to forget about the negatives and continue doing what you think you're good at. When you've set out in Antarctica, you've got to look into it very deeply and find why previous people had failed and why that was as far as humans had been, no further. Every government in the world forbids their citizens going into the interior, i.e. the vast middle bit, uh, except for three months a year. So nine months of the year, you're not allowed there because there's no rescue facility anywhere and if you ask for rescue, you won't get it and therefore you become embarrassing to your government. Go as far as you can in that three months. But part of the three months is when the ship can get through the summer ice. So you haven't got three months, you've just got maybe one month to get inland as far as you can go. And then you have to sit there for nine months. You get very hungry, you get crutch rot, gangrene. Basically, a weak voice comes into your head saying, I want to stop. But it's not just your head that it's coming into, it's the other blokes. So as leader, you've got to choose the right blokes because if he loses the mental battle and can't take it, the whole expedition is wiped out. Seven years preparation wasted. I invent my own mental way of fighting this nasty, weak voice, which is to imagine that the people I respect most, my dad and my granddad, are actually watching and I don't want to do something to let them down. I don't like solo expeditions. And the only reason I do solo things is when the Norwegians have done that particular record with two people. So the only way of beating them is to do it with one person. And it always leads to disaster. Everybody knows, fall into a crevasse. You need someone else to pull you up. I would never have had to lose my finger ends if I'd had my colleague, Mike Stroud, with me. Anybody who has chosen a particular path, I would say follow your dream at all costs. And the only person who should make you change from that course is if you decide to change from that course, not anybody else. <laughs>